chasing, putting my faith in, let it fade, let it break into pieces. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. There's nothing I desire that can't be found in you. You're everything that I've ever needed. Just give me Jesus. Oh, just give me Jesus. Hey, good morning, faith family. It's good to be with you today. My name is Stephen. If you've got your Bible, and I hope that you do, turn with me to Mark chapter 10. We're going to pick up in verse 1 there in just a minute, Mark chapter 10. If you're uh, staying home because you've got some AC and are staying connected with us, we're grateful to do that um, as well. I can't help but feel a little bit responsible uh, for this heat wave, and some of you have let me know that you're convinced that it's my fault. Um, Almost a year ago to the day, we were getting ready to hopefully come here for good to partner ministry with you at Faith, and I was trying to get my house in Texas ready to sell, and I actually had to change my flights coming here because we weren't ready, and I was in my front yard. I had just laid a a whole batch of new sod because grass dies every year, and you got to replace it every year if you want to look nice, and uh, a $700 water bill later that month, my sod took, and it worked, and it's up to some other sucker to keep it alive now. But I took the temperature under this live oak tree in our front yard, and it was 107 degrees. And I was like, I am out of here. Forget this place. <laughs> so this is like that moment, and we're going to preach through Jonah next year. Part of that story of Jonah where like stuff starts to go south, and they start looking around and kind of seeing who's here, who's new, whose fault is it. And so that's how I feel today. Have you ever had a a conversation with someone and as they uh, introduce a new topic, you're like, nope, don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the opposite of what you're talking about. And and sometimes folks that do this can get pretty belligerent. And like you and I both know, it takes two people to have an argument, but these type of people like to test that theory out. They don't actually need you to talk that much. They're just going to keep saying what they want to say keep questioning what they want to question, keep arguing the way they want to argue, right? Today, in our passage today, Jesus encounters a group of people like that. The Pharisees come and ask him a question about divorce, and Jesus wants to talk about the opposite of that. Jesus wants to talk about marriage. And so we're going to read the text and pray, and then I've got a whole bunch of pastoral kind of caveats I want you to hear from me that I was tempted to give you before we jumped into the Word so you wouldn't tune uh, me out, but I don't, think, I don't think you need my caveats to get in between you and the words. Does this make sense? And so we're going to read through it together. Uh, I'm going to give you those caveats, and then we're going to walk through our time together in God's Word. Mark chapter 10, we're going to read 1 through 12, share a prayer together, and keep marching through this book together. Starting in verse 1, And he, Jesus, left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter, verse 11. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Let's pray together. Father, we come again to your text and your word, and Lord, we we come to our knees, God, in surrender, asking you to uh, be the leader of our church, the king of our hearts. God, would you raise up uh, among faith church hundreds of couples committed to the vision of marriage we just heard about from your son Jesus. Uh, Marriages that are imperfect, but perfectly leaning on you. Uh, wholly dependent on you, quick to admit fault and to seek reconciliation in Jesus. Nobody is quicker to reconcile people than you are. And so thanks that you never let us down, that you never fail us. Guide our time together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want you to write down, if you write down one sentence, I want it to be this one today. This is kind of, I'm laying all my cards down on the table for you this morning, okay? The best way uh, to prevent divorce is to love the one who creates marriage. Uh, Nobody on their wedding day says, you know, I'm planning on doing this for seven years. 
13 years, 17 years, whatever the number is sometimes that people divorce at. And, and so the, the best way you can do that, if that makes you nervous or anxious, or I remember after I'd even met my wife Haley, uh, when we were still dating, being terrified of marriage. Not that I, I could commit to someone, but I had a hard time seeing myself as someone that somebody would want to commit themselves to. And so whatever the, the kind of fear or doubt is for you, the best way to do that is not to focus on divorce, but to watch Jesus talk about how good and beautiful marriage is supposed to be. And so if you're married, that's the goal for you. You want to be a better husband? Love Jesus. You want a better wife? Love Jesus. If you're single and you want this thing that you don't yet have, the best spot for you to do, the best thing for you to do is to love Jesus. It is the best way to prevent divorce. And I want you to hear, hopefully, my heart through this. I'm a husband as well. The, the humility of trying to set my marriage before you and, and to be somewhat of a model, but also being quick to admit failures and trying. Nobody on this stage should ever pretend to be perfect. There's only one perfect person, and he was single his whole life. <laughs> Maybe we should learn something from that, right? But listen, in a room this size and even knowing many of your stories now, the reality of divorce is, is here. It's in this room. And so some of you have failed in this area of your life with Christ. Some of you have experienced someone else failing. Unfortunately, it only takes one person to to ruin a marriage. But I want you to hear something today that Jesus never fails you. There is, there's no accident that of all the relationships in humanity the Bible speaks about, and there's teaching to a wide breadth of human relationships we experience, it's this relationship, the relationship between a husband and a wife where Jesus says, that's a little bit of how I love my bride, the church. And so regardless of where you've been, regardless of the pain that you've either caused and or experienced, Jesus will never, ever, ever fail you. I'm also looking at some of our single friends in the room, and you're thinking, just give me a shot at it. I won't screw it up. A lot of us, the majority of us, have the thing that, if you're probably honest, you want the most. And a lot of us take for granted the gift of a spouse. Uh, and, And so this, if you're not careful, this can become an idol. Once you have it, then kids might become an idol. All of these relationships that God never promises to owe us. He doesn't owe us salvation or forgiveness of sins. He certainly doesn't owe us a spouse and two and a half kids and a Labrador and an SUV. We've kind of concocted this American dream and sort of squeezed Jesus into that instead of pausing and thinking about things the way the Bible talks about him. You know, every now and then churches will hire a single pastor on their team and that makes some people nervous. You know, like what, what's going to Are they going to date people? How's that going to work? Whatever. If we believe 1 Corinthians 7, we should seek to hire single people before married people because you get more bang for your buck. <laughs> There's a less divided anxiety, as Paul talks about, and we'll reference that, that passage a little bit later on today, but there is, a, there is a, a, a season of singleness that is universal to all of us at some point, um, that we have a window, and usually it's a small window, and I think most spouses in this room, if they were honest, would say they have neglected that window or failed to seize it for the gift that it was uh, to really make a deeper and more profound impact for the Lord. And there are, are tons of ways you can serve better as a spouse than as a single person. But I love that the Bible uplifts a status in life that so many of us push down. There's some, uh, so if you're single in the room, I want you to know that God, God sees you and he loves you and so does your church family here. There's also some second, third, fourth marriages in the room. God sees you, he loves you, and so do we. And so that's where we're headed today. We've got a tough teaching to walk through today. And uh, if you Google this passage and some of the others in the New Testament like it, you'll find all kinds of sermons that say, well, yeah, but, but this, or but not here. And we're going to do the best of our ability today to set forth what Scripture actually says. So look here at verse 1. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. Crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. Jesus left uh, Galilee, likely Capernaum. That's the last city kind of marker we have for him in the Gospel of Mark so well. And he moves over into Judea. And so once again, Jesus is crisscrossing back and forth between Gentile territory and Jewish kind of territory. The Gospel of Jesus is for all people. No matter how long you've been in religious sort of circles or not, Jesus wants to change your life. If he's got to change you from excessive morality, he'll do that. If he's got to change you from excessive worldliness, he'll do that. And a lot of us are some mixture of the middle there in between. And 
In chapter 10, we're in this third chapter of Jesus' kind of prolonged teaching on discipleship as he's on this journey towards Jerusalem. The next chapter, chapter 11, is the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. We're nearing the last few days now of the life of Christ here on earth. And he's got one more chapter here of kind of narrowing in this teaching on what it means to actually follow him, and it gets progressively more specific. So today we're going to talk about marriage, next week he talks about children, and then possessions. And so Jesus takes these concepts of what it means to follow him and puts kind of flesh and blood and real life examples before him. Aren't you glad Jesus teaches like that? He doesn't just tell us what to do. He's like, this is how you should do this in your marriage with kids, with stuff, with the things that we have, but that all too often sort of have possession over us. And I love that Jesus is a teacher. He moves into Judea, back into Jewish territory, and people come to him. He gathers them. Jesus teaches in synagogues. He teaches on the streets. He teaches in people's houses, in fields, on mountains. Our God, in flesh, wants to teach about who he is. That's why sermons are important. That's why daily time in the Word is important. You are not going to follow Jesus sufficiently if you're just here for kind of the first part of a service. Or if if worship is one of the things that really comes alive for you, if if you're like me and that's just a meaningful time of engaging with the Lord, that's great. Uh, This is greater. I'm not saying because it's what I do, uh, but it's like the Word is how we filter out what songs to sing and not sing. How to pray and not pray. How to give and not give. How to share our faith with someone and how not to share our faith with someone. The Word is the chief way we encounter God. and It's the chief way God presents himself to us. And so Jesus teaches, verse 2, Pharisees came up, always bad news, <laughs> and then we get more clarity, and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Here, the parallel passages, especially in Matthew, so Mark's written first, uh, Matthew is written, and Luke are written after that, and so Mark's written for brevity. How can I make this the shortest, most simple thing ever? Matthew gives more context to this story. Matthew chapter 9, verse 3, the Pharisees' question adds this, um, this phrase, is it lawful or is it, uh, is it okay to divorce one's wife for any cause? If you have like the NIV, it says for any and every reason, that gets to the heart of where we're at. Pharisees are coming to test Jesus, saying, hey, we've got these wives, this wife at home, can we get rid of her for anything? Like, essentially, are there limits to what we can divorce our wives over or not? Look at what Jesus responds in verse 3. He answered them, what did Moses command you? Think about that word command, it's important. We'll come back to it as we kind of move through here. They said, Moses allowed, another important word, a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away, Moses allowed, the referencing Deuteronomy 24, the first verse, that allows for a man to divorce his wife if he finds, quote, any uncleanliness in her, any uncleanliness. And so the question is, like, well, what, is that, what does that mean? And actually, before we get like in the, all this is the Bible's too patriarchal kind of crowd, um, this was actually God's protection for women. Uh, in this culture uh, and that time, uh, women could be cast aside, both in and outside of other religions, for little to no reason. And so God's saying, no, no, you can't just do that. You can't just marry somebody and throw her out for any reason. But even if you do that, you have to give her this certificate of divorce saying that she uh, is, is able to go get married again. It kind of charts what, what happened in this marriage. It allows her some level of social standing and protection, a gift. This sounds so archaic, I know, but like a gift that wasn't available to them before God intervened. So far too often the Bible gets accused of and and God himself gets accused of being too patriarchal, too limiting, and it's all by people that don't read the Bible well. And so this gift, even this gift of a certificate of divorce was God's protecting the most vulnerable among them. And so from this verse, Deuteronomy 24.1, sprung two kind of primary ways or two schools of thinking about this verse in light of what Jesus just said. Uh, One is this guy, Rabbi Shammai, uh, and, and he held this conservative view, meaning you're only allowed to divorce your wife from sexual immorality. Okay, Matthew 19 adds that sexual immorality clause as a biblical valid reason for divorcing one's wife. That's, that's how they define that uncleanliness phrase. Uh, but then Rabbi Hillel came along afterwards and he said, no, no, no. When God said uncleanliness, he meant anything that sort of bothers you. No men said amen. I was just making sure. Okay, good. And in the Mishnah, this, extra, this book of extra-biblical rabbinic teachings, you can, you can look at Rabbi Hillel's quotes, and he actually includes as an example, if she burns your breakfast, 
You can, you can divorce her. Anything that bothers you. Good, okay, no more amens. Just a second, just a second. And so these Pharisees come from that school of thought. They are assuming that they have power that's not theirs to have, that they get to abuse and mistreat in ways that is not God's best for them. And so Jesus goes on to clarify here in verse 5, this Mosaic law was a, a concession. Right? It's due to the hardness of your heart Did he write this. Right? It's not God's ideal design. Uh, this, this is a really, should be a, a pause moment for us. Rather, it applies to marriage and divorce in your life or not, but just a, a warning. At some point, God is willing to give you and I what we want most. If we allow our hearts to be hardened against his heart, against his desire, against his... This is people from within the nation of Israel. People claiming to know Yahweh and follow him and want to read his words and want to understand and likely had whole books of the Old Testament memorized at some point in their life. That God says, I can see that you want something more than you want me and so I'm just going to eventually let you have it. Romans 1 picks up on that same phrase that God turns us over to those desires if we desire something more than him. That scares me. And I think it should give us a pause moment here as well. Verse 6. But from the beginning of creation. See here, this is why I love Jesus. They have all these divorce. And, and these two rab- rabbinic schools, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel, they would have been immediately what people thought of as they heard this. They would have already kind of known what camp they were in. They would have likely already had these debates. And so the fact that you may have never heard those names uh, doesn't mean that these people didn't know exactly what those kind of two schools were thinking. They think they've got Jesus trapped. They want to talk about divorce. He wants to talk about marriage. Verse 6. From the beginning, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no one separate. Do you see that? God does the joining from the beginning. Marriage is a gift to us from God meant to be enjoyed. Uh, the Bible's clear in 1 Corinthians 7, there are some among us that are called to a lifelong uh, pursuit, a uh, life of singleness. Um, the statistics say that is uh, not close to the majority of us, right? And here's the scary thing is, is if you want to get married, stats say 97% of people that want to get married will at one point. And so then it's just, is it going to be the right person or not? And I'm not saying that your soulmate, that doesn't exist. I'm saying, are you going to be the right person Are you marrying someone who's going to be the right person, who's going to follow Jesus the way that God's called your family to follow him together? And so if you want that and you're here and you're single, you are probably going to get it, but be careful about who it's with. But God does the joining. It's a gift from him. Adam and Eve don't link up together and God's like, wait, what are they doing? Like he gave it to them. He walks Eve down this aisle and gives her over to her husband Adam, it doesn't mean all of us are going to get to have that, but it does mean that when it happens, it's a gift from God. And that should instill in us a humility towards our marriage, a humility towards, if you're thinking of your spouse far too often as primarily someone to serve you, you miss this truth, that marriage is a gift given to us by God. Jesus gets a chance here to redefine marriage. He quotes all the way back from Genesis 2. He gets a quote, Jesus could say, man, that is so antiquated and so uh, foreign and really we're awfully enlightened now and, and that text didn't have in mind modern relationships like we have today and so Jesus couldn't have meant that, God couldn't have meant that in the garden. Here in, in Mark, in Matthew 19, in Ephesians 5, Paul quotes the exact same thing. Every time the Bible talks about marriage, it uses these words. God's definition of marriage has not changed, ours has. And it's changed in 15 different ways. I'm not talking just about homosexuality. When a believer marries a non-believer, that's outside of God's plan. Uh, when a non-believer marries a non-believer, that's outside of God's plan. Uh, when, when there's sexual immorality sin within a marriage, which is a much more applicable thing in the church that we should deal with, that's outside of God's plan. We mess this up a number of different ways, and so don't hear me pressing one over the other. I want you to see that Jesus, though, I love this. He doesn't rail against all of those things first. He gets to that. He goes, man, you've forgotten this good vision of what marriage is supposed to be. The beauty of this covenant of one man and one woman together for life. That's the goal. That's the ideal. Verse 10, and in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. 
Um, I'm tempted sometimes, especially if you have a red letter Bible, they can be kind of tricky sometimes. You zoom past kind of those like narr- moving the narration kind of along sentences, right? But don't miss that in verse 10. This was not the only time Jesus taught about marriage. It's just the one time we have preserved here, at least in the Gospel of Mark so far. Jesus had a bunch of other conversations with his disciples about marriage. This is the one Mark's chosen, by inspired by the Holy Spirit, to give to us today. Uh, but if you're looking for like a one-time teaching on marriage, this is not going to be it. Because Jesus decided that wasn't going to be it. When you look at the beauty of marriage, you look at the whole counsel of God's word. Verse 11 and 12 here. Jesus said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. We get this added phrase from Matthew 19 about this sexual immorality clause that's there. So if one person commits sexual immorality, that word in Greek is porneia. You probably recognize that from the root of pornography. And so again, God, every time that word is used, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality, and we're trying to flirt with it too much. And God says, flee. And we say, well, how far is too far? And God's like, I can answer that question. It's just a dumb question. It's not the right heart to approach that way, right? Like, we can say where lust hits and where sin starts. That's not the point, okay? And so we're, we're, we're flirting with stuff God says flee from. And so with that word, sexual immorality can take a whole lot of, of different looks in a marriage. Um, but don't miss this too. The Bible permits divorce but never commands it. There, there are stories of restorations of multiple affairs and marriages that have been knit back together in this room right now. And, and you know, God gets a lot of glory from telling that story. And so where you have biblical grounds to divorce your spouse, uh, I'm not going to ra- raise a more strict uh, expectation on you than the Bible has. But I also know that divorce is permitted in those spots and not commanded. And I think that distinction is significant for us. Because where two people can try at the same time, and I mean actually try, not words try, actions try. When that lines up at the same time, God can fix everything. God can fix everything in a marriage. But sexual immorality can take a whole number of different ways. And here's what I would counsel, especially men that are struggling with pornography, and increasingly the the rates among women are going up and up and up as well. Um, If you have somebody that you're talking about it with, uh, then you're probably going to succeed, and if you don't, you don't. At least that's been my history with it from high school and into college. Like, when it's a sin that you can confess before another brother or sister in the church, someone who's not your spouse, someone who's not just a pastor or a counselor, when you'll bring in a trusted friend, one, not 50, don't do this at Life Group, but like one, and say, man, here's, here's where I'm at. And that's a scary thing it is to think about. And some of you are in this right now, and you're thinking, I can't do that. I, I can't share that. They see me as a, as a leader, as a teacher, as a, I've been here for a million years. Like, whatever it is for you, that's the key to getting over this sin in particular. It's probably true for all sins, but this one in particular. If you confess it, you can get over it. And if you, if you don't, you won't. And if I'm a betting man, I'm putting all my chips on that theory because it's proven out over and over and over again with young people, with older folks, and everybody in between. And so where does that then leave us? We've got this tough teaching on marriage. As you go through the rest of the New Testament, there's only one other spot where an extra kind of clause is added. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15, Paul talks about the scenario where a non-believing spouse uh, abandons a believing spouse. Then that person, that brother or sister, is not bound in that marriage anymore. And again, is permitted to leave, even though they're not commanded uh, to leave. These verses, when we knit all this stuff together, we're left with a vision of marriage that has kind of fallen short in the church in a lot of ways. And I want to flip sides and kind of argue the other side of this for a moment. You've seen the stories and the stats about the marriage rate or the divorce rate in the church being basically the same as outside. That's just not true, at least not in churches like ours. If you as a husband and wife, as a, as a married couple, will together engage consistently two to three times a month uh, with a Bible teaching uh, church and have some level of spiritual conversations at home, that rate goes from like 50% down to 18%. If you just go to a good church and talk about Jesus at home, it drops it from 50 to 18 And not just any church, a good church. Churches that teach the Bible. Churches that love Jesus well. That actually love you too much to not say the hard things to you. Because here's what I know. I've got a a board of elders and staff and hopefully a bunch of men in this church that if I started straying two ticks left, uh, they would come after me. And they would lovingly, and if they won't, Haley's going to send them. Because people don't blow up their lives overnight. They just don't. 
It's this slow drift that all of us should be cautious and careful of. And far too often in the scriptures, especially like in 1 Corinthians 5, there's this sexual scandal in the church. And Paul gets more upset at the church for letting it happen than the people involved. You and I have an obligation. to do, When we talk about membership and belonging to one another, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. We have an obligation to love one another well into and through these hard conversations. And in too many churches, in too many cities, we're, we're laying aside that duty. One of my takeaways from today is that we should just take marriage more seriously. Uh, we should be maybe slower to get into it, or you should be faster to get into it. Uh, I think it can go both ways. Um, the only regret I have about marrying Haley is we couldn't have started earlier. And we got married 17 days after I turned 21, which I'm certain caused panic attacks across my entire family. (laughs) But she was already out of college for a little bit, and so my dad handed handed her my cell phone bill on my wedding day and said, he's yours now. (laughs) (laughs) He was good with it. He approved. (laughs) Uh, So some of you, though, you're you're in this spot of you're single, and you're into your 20s and your 30s, your 40s, you're single again, and you're overvaluing that independence that you have that individualism that you have. And for you, marriage needs to be more, taken more seriously like you need to step into it when God provides that good gift to you. Um, some of us are too quick to get into it, though. Marriage is something that fills your needs and makes you feel better and loved and accepted. And so wherever you're at, especially if you're single, marriage needs to be taken more seriously. If you're currently married, if you have the gift of that blessing that so many of our friends in this room want and don't yet have, don't uh, uh, lo- fail to love them well by neglecting the spouse that God has already given you. That's your person for life. Doesn't matter how you got there, you're with them now. <laughs> and so power through. Love Jesus together. Serve Jesus together. Be in church together. Fight for your marriage together. Two people with Jesus, that's all you need. That's a majority in any battle you're ever going to be in, ever. God is with you. I want to circle back to this first sentence that I gave you at the very beginning. The best way to prevent divorce is to love the one who created marriage. Uh, we've, we've got marriage books we can recommend. I loved having my friend Kevin come in and share with us. If you were at that marriage conference a few weeks ago, I hope it was and continues to be a blessing uh, to you. We are uh, all about giving resources and pumping out, uh, referring to people that are sort of helpful in this way, uh, who can give you practical tips in your marriage. The best way is for you to love Jesus. And so tomorrow morning, if your marriage is struggling, you probably don't need a marriage blog as much as you need time in the Word. As much as you need to maybe even fall literally on your knees in prayer tomorrow. And before you start swiping on your phone, you start praying not just for your spouse, but for yourself. Isn't it funny how when you start praying for you to become the kind of person you wish they were, that kind of fades away. And God begins to do a work on our hearts in the process. And then I want to remind you of this last thing. Um, even if you have the, the life story of you got married coming out of college and you're together and you're together now decades and decades and decades after. And some of you I know have kids that love Jesus and they have kids that love Jesus. And you just have this legacy of people in your life that love Jesus and that find a spouse and that stay together and make more people and they do the same thing. That is awesome. There's still failure in marriage somewhere. It may not be this colossal failure, but if you have a great kind of outward looking kind of marriage, be cautious of over assessing how good it actually is. And remember in that humility that Jesus gave it to you. You didn't earn it from good decision making or hard work or or abstaining from sexual sin like other people did, like didn't do, but you did. And so that's why God owes you this marriage you're into. Jesus will never fail you. If you have cycled through spouse after spouse after spouse, Jesus looks at you the exact same. Even in this idea of marriage being a covenant, and this is the primary way we see in Scripture that God, through Christ, relates to the church. There's not tiers of covenant members. There's not first marriage and second marriage and third marriage people. There's not sexually pure people and sexually deviant people. We are all on the same footing at the cross. Jesus never fails, you or me, even though we always will until one day we won't. We'll be in the presence of God and we'll be perfect together because of his grace, not because of our achievements. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your word as it continues to govern and guide our church. 
God, like all text, I just think about would you, God, through the power of your spirit and live and inside of each one of your children this morning, would you expose in us where our vision of marriage is falling short to the one in your word? God, we're taking a spouse for granted or not taking the pursuit of one seriously enough. If we're overvaluing independence or if we're ungrateful for the spouse you've already given to us, God, raise up our eyes to see marriage as you have designed it to be seen. God, undoubtedly in this room, there is a train of failures in this area though too. It's got if that's us, if we're thinking of a, a past marriage that didn't work out or a, an infidelity or a divorce without grounds and now we're married again and don't know how to think about that, God, would you just embody all of those tensions and concerns and remind us who we are in Christ? The, the best marriages on this earth are, are temporary, are momentary compared to the covenant, the eternal covenant of being the bride of Christ together. Thank you, Jesus, there aren't levels in the church. There's not levels of your love or your access. Remind us today, God, the most broken, the most rejected, the most passed over. God, remind us today that we are more than conquerors in Christ. That when we have you, we have a majority, we have everything that we need. Thank you for these moments we get to share together. Would you be honored, King Jesus, as we continue to worship this morning? In Jesus' name, amen.